world land and out here in California where it's foggy. I've got Mitch Roth and Joe Sanskrant today for a very comprehensive quick update on the TCPA changes with the FCC. Pleasure to have both uh, Joe and Mitch with, with us today. Just want to say hello. Pleasure, real quick. Uh, pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure, Mitch, to, uh, to get the act back together. Yes, it's been quite some time. Yeah. Yeah, for the people that don't know, uh, Joe and Mitch uh, had a road show about compliance for years, <laughs> and they would go around the country, and it was, it was uh, loosely coined the Joe and Mitch show after a while. That's but, true. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to travel today, and you can just join us here and, and get what you need, and, and uh -huh. I think get some timely information, because this is all fairly new in terms of being published. It was actually listed a while back. Um, and so I think some people got some initial ideas, but lots of questions about the changes here in my office. And I know Joe and Mitch are getting calls and having people wonder, how is this going to be impacted? Is there going to be a grace period for some of the interactive opt-outs? Uh, so let's just kind of jump through and get into the, the topics that we're going to cover. The well, the people we've got on the phone today are some of the best uh, in the business as far as Joe and Mitch in terms of breaking down the laws and it, how they're going to be applied, what uh, maybe defenses you could come up with to abate any changes, how you can plan for them, and when they're going to take effect. Um, Joe and Mitch uh, both have way more experience combined than I do in this industry in terms of contact center compliance. Our company is a good choice when it comes to partnering with a compliance provider. Joe and Mitch are both on the legal side, uh, work for pro predominant firms out there helping their clients, and we provide the technology behind a lot of the do not call and wireless scrubbing. So we, we get the questions from our clients and people looking for solutions. We will have time for some questions at the end here. Um, and the way those are going to be handled is just basically submit them online in the text box with GoToMeeting. And we will then uh, try to get to those at the end. If we don't get to your question, we'll probably have a chance to follow up with you via email. And we also uh, will have a recording of this along with the slides out to everybody within a couple days. So if you got folks that uh, couldn't attend or you want to uh, jump out early, we don't recommend you do, um, then you'll be able to uh, get into the content. So let me go down to the next slide. Joe's going to kick it off in terms of uh, what you might want to learn from today's webinar and kind of go through some of the basics of what's, what's been changed, uh, how we got here, and then uh, Mitch is going to give us some of the real practicality and what what the FCC really means because Mitch has really been involved with um, the FCC in terms of trying to fight potential changes and things like that. And so that being said, I'm going to make two quick predictions. The first one is the Giants are going to take Detroit in five games. And uh, the second one is uh, that uh, within the next year, there's going to be, a, I think, a tremendous increase in uh, the class actions around the TCPA. We've already seen, I've seen a couple articles today, people making the same kind of, seeing the same kind of things. So I hand that over to Joe, we'll get this thing rolling. Thank you very much, Ryan. And let me just say for the record that uh, I declared the uh, Benghazi terror attack an act of terror from the get-go. But moving forward, the objectives for today are, uh, we just recently, uh, there was a notice that was posted in the Federal Register regarding uh, the approval by the Office of Management and Budget of uh, its review of the uh, the new FCC report and order that came out uh, not so new, actually, in February 2012. Um, now, Ryan and I and Mitch, and we've all covered a lot of this territory before, but what we wanted to do now that it's become official and we, and we have an implementation timeline in place, we wanted to go uh, over the background of the rules, we wanted to review the specifics of the rules. And then, most importantly, uh, in terms of this discussion, we want to look into and explain 
when these new rules are going to be implemented. And we need to look at uh, the abandoned call measurement rule, automated opt-out, phasing out the EBR exemption regarding pre-recorded calls, and then also obtaining express written consent if you're calling cell phone. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Ryan, go on to the next page. And I will very briefly give a background. I'm big on, uh, as Mitch knows, I'm big on giving background. I think in order to understand where we are, we sometimes have to take a look at where we've been. Um, the, the genesis of this whole thing uh, was back in 2008 when the Federal Trade Commission changed its rules governing pre-recorded messaging. And uh, this was a big, big change for the industry. Uh, all pre-recorded telemarketing calls had to have express written consent. And then on top of that, the FTC required uh, an opt-out via an automated key press or, or voice-activated mechanism for all pre-recorded telemarketing messages. So not only was express written consent required, but also uh, there was a technological aspect to what the FTC put into place. Now, a key thing about the Federal Trade Commission versus the Federal Communications Commission, I call the Federal Trade Commission uh, and its uh, structure for creating rules technology agnostic. The FTC doesn't, uh, doesn't care uh, if you're making the call via uh, a landline, uh, I'm sorry, to a landline or to a wireless number. It doesn't care uh, what technology you're using to make the call, predictive dial versus manual dialing. Um, to that extent, the FTC has uh, an easier job of creating rules because the Federal Communications Commission has to work within the confines of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act that does, in fact, divide up phone calls based upon the technology to make the call and then where the call is ultimately going. And uh, you'll see how that plays out, uh, as Mitch and I talk about the, uh, the new rules uh, that the FCC promulgated. In January of 2010, the FCC came out with a notice of proposed rulemaking, and it proposed a whole bunch of different things. Uh, but then in February of 2012 of this year, the FCC finalized everything and uh, issued its report and order that put into place, uh, or at least, well, let's just say finalized the new rules that the FCC was going to hold uh, the telemarketing industry accountable for. Um, and the last element of all this is the, the implementation program that the FCC put into place. The FCC recognizes that these are some big changes that it is requiring, and it, it wanted to give the industry uh, sufficient time in order to implement these new changes. So let's go on to the next slide. And Mitch, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, predictive dial uh, calls and pre-recorded calls to cell phones. Hey, thanks, Joe, and Ryan, thanks also for putting this together. Uh, over the next couple slides, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the substantive changes that go into effect um, at the various time, in, during the various time frames having to do with how you can make calls and what devices you can call and what the do's and the don'ts are. With respect to calls to cell phones using predictive dialers where live agents are intended to be on the call, or pre-recorded calls to cell phones where no live agent is ever intended to be on the call. In those contexts, under the old rule, you could not make any type of pre, uh, predictive dial call or pre-recorded call or any call using what the FCC considers to be an automatic telephone dialing system to cell phones without prior express consent. So the terminology to be aware of under the old rule was prior express consent. And there was a lot of discussion and debate about what constituted prior express consent. But the FCC makes a lot of that uh, controversy and debate go away under the new rules. Under the new rules, the FCC really views the universe in terms of two categories. You have telemarketing calls and all other calls. With respect to any telemarketing call, okay, any call that's made with the intent to sell a good or a service, that's dialed to a cell phone using any type of automated dialing system or a predictive dialer, or any call that's intended to transmit a pre-recorded message. You cannot initiate that call unless you have the recipient's prior express written consent. 
Okay, so we've gone from a prior express consent standard, which did not necessarily require written consent, to a standard that requires prior express written consent. And the FCC also provides a pretty lengthy and specific definition about what constitutes written consent. Okay, so it's relatively straightforward. If it's a sales call to a um, cell phone using a predictive dialer, automated telephone dialing system, or the transmission of a pre-recorded message, you must have that written consent. However, if it is a call made by or on behalf of a tax exempt or a nonprofit organization, even if the purpose is to initiate a sale, then the FCC maintains the current standard of prior express consent. So in other words, no writing is required. Finally, you have the group of calls that we generally call HIPAA calls, calls made pursuant to the, um, to, uh, the Health Insurance Portability Act. If it's a HIPAA call and it delivers what's considered to be a health care message, and I use that term in quotes, a health care, a health care message as defined by HIPAA, and it is transmitted by a covered entity also as defined by HIPAA, then the current standard is in effect. Again, no writing is requirement and all you need in order to transmit that call is prior express consent. All other calls which we consider to be the catch-all, where no sales call is being made, no sale of any good or service is intended, and the purpose of the call is for information purposes, for polling purposes, for collections purposes, any other purpose that does not include the sale of a product or service, then the current standard will remain in effect, which is prior express consent. Ryan can go on to the next slide. The other the other type of call that is significantly affected by the new regulations has to do with the transmission of pre-recorded calls to residential lines. Under the old rule, although there was a specific prohibition on the transmission of pre-recorded calls without express consent, there was a litany of available exemptions. One of the most discussed and most utilized exemption for that permitted individuals or entities to transmit pre-recorded sales calls to uh, residential lines was the EBR relationship. If a telemarketer had any type of existing business relationship or established business relationship with the consumer who was going to receive the call, then that telemarketer or that seller could go ahead and transmit pre-recorded calls. Now the FTC removed the EBR exemption in August 2008 and required written consent. And that's exactly what the FCC is requiring under the new rules. So to be clear, under the new rules, now both the FTC and the FCC both prohibit the transmission of pre-recorded sales calls to residential lines without prior express written consent. Any other type of call, any other type of call you do not need that written consent in order to transmit the pre-recorded uh, sales message but you do require express written consent. And again, HIPAA calls and calls on behalf of tax-exempt entities are exempt from that standard. Joe, do you want to go ahead and talk about some of the changes with respect to abandoned calls? Sure, absolutely. And, and Ryan, let's go on to the next slide. Um, I, I think in, in practice, uh, maybe all the, the kind of nuanced changes that have occurred uh, with regard to abandoned calls, maybe it's not all that important to uh, uh, to many call centers that are out there. But I think uh, for big call centers that have a whole bunch of different campaigns going and um, uh, they're attempting to try to keep their abandonment rate uh, below the three percent that's required, uh, this is a it's a very very important issue. Um, the old rule that the FCC had in place was that you measure your abandonment rate every thirty days across all calling campaigns. I think it's understandable that uh, this, if you're going to have an abandoned call uh, measurement rule, this is the way to do it. You know, you, you uh, uh, measure it out over 30 days, but you get to do it across all calling campaigns. So if you have some campaigns that happen to be above 3%, that's okay because you might have other bigger campaigns that are uh, at below 3% and everything averages out. Well, the FTC has long required uh, that you measure your abandonment rate on a 30-day 
successive day basis per campaign. So for every campaign that you're running, uh, you, you measure your abandonment rate. It's got to be below uh, 3%. And it's, you measure it on a successive day basis. And what that means is if you start your campaign on day one, you measure from day one to day 30. And then you measure from day 31 to day 60, and so on and so on. Um, the FCC had actually proposed a rolling measurement, which would be at any given point pick out 30 days in the campaign, it could be day 23 to 52 or whatever, and uh, you had to have a 3% abandonment rate within that 30-day period. Okay, so the FCC came out and says, we are going to adopt the same rule that the FTC has in place. Almost, you know, all right, we're, gonna, we're going to measure uh, over a 30-day successive day uh, period, it's on a per campaign basis, and the only difference between the FTC and the FCC um, when it comes to measuring the, uh, uh, the abandoned call uh, rate um, and also disclosures that you have to make in the context of the abandoned call, under the new FCC rules, you have to disclose that the call was for, quote, telemarketing purposes, along with the name and telephone number of the seller. And uh, as Mitch and I have noted for uh, a while, that the, the phrase telemarketing purposes is uh, in quotation marks. And uh, that raises the question of whether you need to specifically use the words telemarketing purposes. And uh, we'll just leave that up to the uh, discretion of individual call centers, how they want to handle that. And uh, the FCC also uh, came out with a, a definition of the term campaign. And the FCC uh, uh, deferred to the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission had their own definition that they used in the uh, 2008 uh, telemarketing sales rule changes that they announced. And uh, so the definition of a campaign is the offer of the same good or service for the same seller. So to the extent that you can think broadly about that definition of a campaign, perhaps uh, a call center might be able to, uh, you know, uh, have a little bit of leeway when it comes to measuring their abandonment call rates, abandoned call rates. All right, so uh, let's move on to the next slide and talk about uh, automated opt-outs. And uh, we have, Mitch and I have plenty to talk about when it comes to this one, um, but uh, let's first take a look at the Federal Trade Commission rule. Um, so if you are delivering a pre-recorded telemarketing call, and apologies that I'm using just the abbreviations here, um, but a pre-recorded telemarketing call that could be answered by a person, you have to have an interactive voice or key press opt-out. And then the same thing, uh, the FTC came out with a, kind of a squishy rule. If you have a pre-recorded telemarketing call that could be answered by an answering machine, you have to disclose the toll-free uh, number from where you're calling. Now, that the FCC rule, of course, raises the issue of, well, how do you know if it could be answered by a person or could be answered by an answering machine? Um, you really don't know going into the phone call whether it is going to be answered by a person or by an answering machine. And so the, uh, the answer to this is uh, in your, uh, uh, in the, you just have to require uh, the opt-out, uh, no matter what happens, and uh, include that toll-free number disclosure uh, in your uh, in the uh, message that you deliver, because you don't know whether or not it's going to be answered by a person or by an answering machine. All right, now the FCC rule, pretty much the same as the above, but uh, unlike the FTC, and this is a this is a big big difference, the FCC requires an opt-out during the abandoned call message itself. And also, um, the FCC has, a, uh, in my opinion, a, a more clear rule regarding the toll-free number disclosure. It has to be made during pre-recorded telemarketing messages that are, in fact, left on answering machines. And maybe this is a distinction without a difference, but at least the FCC stayed away from this language of could be answered by a person or could be answered by an answering machine and just said, okay, if the uh, pre-recorded message is in fact 
uh, I'm sorry, if the abandoned call message is in fact left on uh, an answering machine, uh, then you have to include that, uh, that toll-free number disclosure. And that applies to pre-recorded messages as well. So that kind of breaks down uh, what the FCC now requires with regard to automated opt-out. So let's move on to the next slide, Ryan. Implementation deadlines. You know, uh, Mitch, I'll just start with the uh, with the start point. Uh, October 16th, we had uh, po uh, posting in the Federal Register. Uh, the FCC announced that the OMB issued its final approval of the new regulations issued uh, under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And in accordance with the report and order that came out in February of this year, that marks the official start date for taking a look at the implementation of these various rules. So Mitch, take it away. That's right, Joe. And I guess another way to say it is that the clock starts to run on October 16th um, uh, last week with respect to the implementation. The first category of changes are, have to do with the calculation of the abandonment rate and the definition of campaign, which Joe was talking about on the previous slides. Those changes go into effect 30 days from the date of publication, which comes out to November 15, 2012. The changes regarding the requirement that there be an automated interactive opt-out for pre-recorded telemarketing calls. I'm not talking about the abandoned call message. Just pre-recorded telemarketing calls that must have an automated interactive opt-out system. Those changes take, will go into effect on January 14, 2013 with the assumption and the explanation being that the FCC wanted to provide the industry with sufficient time to make any necessary hardware or software changes to their existing equipment to be able to come into compliance. The changes having to do with the phasing out of the EBR exemption for pre-recorded calls to residential lines and for, pre and for all calls to cell phones, either pre-recorded or otherwise dialed by um, some type of automated telephone dialing system, well, those changes will go into effect on October 16, 2003, which is 12 full months following the date of the implementation date or the date of the publication. Again, the explanation being that the FCC wanted to provide the industry with sufficient time, in this case 12 months, to be able to gather the written consents necessary in order to be able to continue to transmit um, pre-recorded sales calls or to be able to call their customers on cell phones. And that leaves us with the deadline for implementing the requirement that the abandoned call message contain an automated interactive uh, opt-out. Joe, since this one was a little bit controversial, I'll let you try to explain it. All right. Um, in my opinion, and uh, there are other, you know, wrong opinions out there. But in my opinion, uh, if you look at the original report and order uh, that the FCC had, uh, came out with in February of uh, 2012, um, the FCC makes it clear that the opt-out uh, that they want to have included in an abandoned call message uh, in, uh, needs to be implemented at the same time as the uh, opt-out for just a regular pre-recorded telemarketing call. That is uh, 90 days from the date of uh, the publication in the Federal Register of the OMB approval. Um, and uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the interactive opt-out for abandoned call messages uh, is therefore the date for implementation is January 14, 2013. The problem is, uh, in the Federal Register notice, uh, the, the language that was used is not particularly clear. Uh, when they're talking about the implementation time frame for the, the new abandoned call rule, they make reference to the section where the abandoned call rule appears. But of course, in that section, uh, as a, a subheading or a subset of the main section, you also have uh, the, the new rule regarding uh, the interactive opt-out for abandoned call messages. So if you just take a look at the Federal Register notice, uh, you might come away with the impression that the, uh, the FCC is saying, okay, all of the abandoned uh, call rule uh, 
items that we have put into place need to be in place by November 15th, and that means the new measurement rule along with the automated interactive opt-out. In my opinion, looking at the report in order, and just from a more common sense standpoint, it doesn't make sense for the FCC to say, all right, we're going to have a 30-day rule for this type of opt-out over here, but then a 90-day rule for this the same sort of opt-out, uh, just in, the, in, in a different context. The whole reason for the FCC providing implementation periods is that they understand that you know changes to technology have to occur, and there's no substantive difference between uh, the opt-out for a pre-recorded call and the opt-out for an abandoned call message. You know, it, it might even be more difficult to have the opt-out in the context of the abandoned call message, which would uh, certainly uh, kind of indicate that the FCC at least wanted to give 90 days for that. So uh, I'm advising uh, my clients that uh, the, the opt-out in the context of the abandoned call message uh, that they have until uh, January 14, 2013 to do it. And But uh, as I indicated before, reasonable minds can disagree, and Mitch, have at it. And this was a topic that Joe and I were, uh, some would say debating, other people would say. Um, we, were, uh, we, were, we were at... We were engaging in fisticuffs over it, I believe. I don't know. Go ahead. And I've actually been in touch with the FCC over this issue uh, on behalf of several of my clients that, that were very concerned. And I actually um, explained it in a manner very similar to what Joe just said, which was if, you, if the commission decided to give until January 14, 2013 for companies to obtain the hardware software mod modifications to come into compliance with the pre-recorded, or I should say with the uh, automated opt-out mechanism for the context of pre-recorded telemarketing calls. It makes absolutely no sense why there would be a different time frame uh, and a different length of time given to companies to come into compliance with the automated opt-out mechanism for the abandoned call message since the modifications that have to be made whether it's technology upgrades or software changes, are exactly the same. Now, the FCC acknowledged that and at least verbally agreed with me. And what I was told was that it was the FCC's intent to make the phase-in requirement for the automated opt-out on the abandoned calls. It was actually their intent to do that on November 15th or to make that effective on November 15th. However, after having heard the explanation that I gave and apparently others gave as well, they were they indicated that they were going to change it to January 14, 2013, so that it is in line with the um, the requirement for the automated opt-out for pre-recorded sales calls. However, what I'm telling my clients is a little bit different from Joe's. I'm telling my clients that. From as far as the regulations, the written regulations are concerned, it's got to go. The change has to go into effect uh, by November 15th for the interactive opt-out for the abandoned call message. However, it's my expectation that the FCC will issue what's called an erratum um, sometime in the next week or so, where they will officially indicate that they are changing that requirement. Uh, to go into effect on January 14, 2013. So I agree with Joe, Joe wholeheartedly of that it doesn't make sense to have the two different um, time frames since the technology upgrades and the software modifications are exactly the same. Um, and I think what most in the industry are doing is changing their, um, going to implement these changes, um, be prepared to implement them if necessary on November 15th. However, um, understand that it's probably going to get delayed officially until January 14th of 2013. Joe, anything you want to add to that? Um, no, no. I, I, I think it's, uh, uh, again, reasonable minds can disagree here. And uh, uh, Mitch, I think it's great that you, uh, that you contacted the FCC and uh, alerted them to this issue. And, uh, you know, uh, it, I guess the, the end result will be uh, by early next year, everyone's going to have this in place anyway, and it's going to be a moot point. Uh, but for right now, a lot of people have been asking about it. And this is, again, one of those issues where 
you can have uh, you know two sets of eyes go in and take a look at all the materials and come out with uh, two different opinions. Again, the, the right opinion and the wrong opinion. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. This has definitely got a number of questions on it about the rule. I think you guys kind of answered them. That's why I didn't put in there. But uh, a lot of people have confused around this particular issue around the opt-outs. What about any kind of grace period for implementation, specifically around that one? Because it's, a lot of times, you know, you might have a dialer company that has to do upgrades, and apparently it's kind of an expensive uh, process for some, some some of the larger companies to go through. You know, they have a lot of seats on certain technology. Is there yeah, any kind of like any ramp up period where like, you know, even that goes into effect, you got a thirty day period after that or is it that would no, drop this in is it. I mean this uh, the FCC was at least um, kind enough or uh, had enough foresight to recognize that uh, these changes require some significant retooling and uh, changing up of technology. So, you know, the, the grace period, as it were, is already built in uh, and, and was built in from uh, the date of the report and order that came out. And that's it. You know, once, once these dates are, uh, once we reach these dates, uh, the, the rule is officially implemented and uh, companies are subject to uh, investigation and enforcement actions by the FCC with regard to them. So what happens if a company calls, you know, some cell phone numbers on a dialer, they didn't have consent, don't have interactive opt-out, maybe abandon it on a call without the proper message, what's the, is the penalty the same? Is there a different amount for each one of these uh, points here? Same. Yeah, same penalty, and I, I, I believe it's $16,000. That's right, 16000 per violation. Yeah. I, I, I'm still shocked at that. I, you know, Mitch, we, we spent years just talking about like eleven thousand dollars, and you know that that in and of itself is uh, too big a number. But yeah, we're up to sixteen thousand, and that's what the FCC can levy per violation. What I kind of mentioned, and I've seen a lot of, is people having to fight uh, class actions or claims in in other courts out of this. Is is that still allowed under the these new amendments? Can a individual consumer, can they form a class, go to an attorney and try to um, quick, push things yeah, that I, way? Uh, and a uh, quick answer, yes. Uh, the, it's still part of the rule. Um, and the uh, the dollar amounts for those are $500 per violation, but up to $1,500 if there's, um, if, uh, you know, they're done knowingly and willfully, uh, you have uh, treble damages associated with that. And so, Ryan, I think you're, I think you're dead right. Any time there's a significant change in the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, uh, there are uh, plenty of attorneys out there and plenty of uh, opportunistic plaintiffs who try to take advantage of it via the form of class action lawsuits. And Joe, in addition to that, it's also attorney's fees. So it's $1,500 plus the uh, attorney's fees. In fact, I just got a, um, a lawsuit sent over to me from a um, client today where they were sued. It's a class action lawsuit having, uh, arising out of the TCPA. Right, and, and with that in mind, I did want to announce that I'm officially switching sides, and I'm going to be a class. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. You hear, the, you hear the laughter out there, Mitch, across the 300 people that are tuned in? I hear it. And we do have going, actually a couple hundred people from, on the phone, so. <laughs> I'm going to refrain from commenting, Joe. <laughs> All right. I want to make one other comment that the other reason I think the FCC frankly gave people a year to put this into place is a lot of people don't know how or what's involved in terms of wireless scrubbing so it gives you uh, ample enough time to uh, work with a company like uh, contact center compliance to uh, get your data scrubbed put a put together a, a process and look at how much data you have now that you need to reach out to and have a, a cell phone scrubbing solution if you're using any any sort of dialer product Right, Ryan, if I could just, just interject, and of course that was a shameless plug and a very effective one that you made, but, <laughs> I, but all, all kidding aside, I mean, this really does raise the stakes um, for all, call, all um, telemarketers or sellers. Uh, you really need to make sure that you know what numbers are cell phones, what numbers are, are not cell phones. Um, there are, there are um, uh, 
ways to get that information. Obviously, companies like um, Contact Center Compliance um, have developed an expertise in it um, in, in order to, to be able to scrub your, your calling list to make sure you're not calling cell phones unless you have the written consent. But again, it, the point cannot be overstated. We were talking about the, um, the potential fines of $16,000, but it really, really is imperative to make sure that companies understand um, what their cell, what what their calling list consists of, and whether they contain any uh, cell phones. Uh, I guess that, that, go ahead. And and I was I'm sorry. The, the corollary of that is, you have a year. Companies have a year to obtain the express written consent to be able to call the cell phones. And I've spent a lot of time over the course of the last several weeks helping clients develop the appropriate language for website marketing and online marketing and lead generation to make sure that the activity or the actions that the consumer takes online constitutes prior express written consent vis-a-vis -vis what they see online at the time that they click that submit button or check that box. That's what I was going to say is that, I mean, when it comes to what, what entails proper consent, you guys want to talk a little bit about that because I know that we get a lot of questions about, okay, great. I need consent. Can I get that through a website? Can I get that through an e-form? Uh, yep. You know, do I have to have to find something? What about a, you know, a, a yes on a verbal recorded call? All those, you know, all the scenarios that you guys probably get. Uh, sure, Mitch, uh, you you raised it, so go on in. Sure. Um, first, the interesting um, tidbit for me is that the FCC in their notice of proposed rulemaking seemed to indicate that it was generally accepted principles that a digital recording of a consumer constitutes written consent, provided, of course, that they that they indicate their acknowledgement or their consent to receive those calls. Now, that that is something which the FTC has never gotten on board. They've never gotten on board that train. The FTC has never expressly acknowledged that written consent can be in the form of, the digital, of a digital voice recording. That issue aside, in terms of what the actual language has to be, you know, the sales and marketing department of your call centers or of, the, of your clients are not going to be very happy when they see the language of the consent because the new regulations do specifically define what prior express written consent consists of. And while I don't have the language in front of me, it's going to require specific language that indicates the consumer will accept calls or consent to receive calls on their cell phone or on the telephone number provided, and they have to acknowledge that the calls may be made by an automatic telephone dialing system. And you know there, there may not be too good of a way to get around having that awkward language in there about having um, the calls being initiated by an automatic telephone dialing system or automated telephone dialing system. Additionally, the consent has to indicate that the consumer is aware that they are not required to provide that consent in order to be eligible to purchase the products or services. So it's requirements that were added in this go-around that were not in the previous version of the FCC's regulations. And again, they really draw attention to the fact that the calls will be made by automated dialing system and that um, the consumer will, are not required to provide that consent in order to be eligible to purchase the services. You know, I do want to make one, one other uh, point, which is that there are some petitions that have been filed uh, requesting that the FCC reconsider it's, um, it's rulemaking. And there's um, three petitions that have been filed, or at least that the FCC um, uh, published. There's also been analogous petitions for declaratory rulings filed by uh, third parties, um, unrelated to the three petitions that were, that were currently pending. And the petitions are, I would say, the different petitions raise three different uh, points. You'd probably group them into three different categories. One, they say that the FCC violated the Administrative Procedures Act by implementing the changes to the um, um, abandoned call message, that is, that the message have the automated opt-out. Um, and without getting too technical on what the Administrative Procedures Act uh, requires, suffice it to say that um, those commenters or those petitioners didn't feel that the FCC did not um, provide ample notice that it was considering making this change, at least enough notice so that the public knew that it should comment on um, on the effect of what those changes will be. The second set of petitions, or a second um, category, 
are petitioners that want the FCC to do away with the requirement or remove the requirement that you cannot call your own customers who have provided that cell phone number to you with, self, um, with sales calls. In other words, they want to keep that same standard in place for sales calls to cell phones when the consumer has specifically provided that cell phone number as a, course, uh, as a, um, as a um, point of contact. And then the third category has to do with changing the definition of automatic telephone dialing system to make it more, I don't want to say user friendly, but without getting too technical, the definition of automatic telephone dialing system currently, its interpretation relies upon the definition or relies upon the um, capacity, and I use that term in quotation marks, the capacity of the equipment in order to do certain functions. And that is why predictive dialers are within the definition of automatic telephone dialing system, not because they have the current capacity to do certain things, but with the, so with the appropriate hardware and software attached to it, they could have the capacity. And again, the FCC has long focused on that potential capacity of the equipment uh, to, to uh, corral in um, predictive dialers within those restrictions on calling cell phones, saying that predictive dialers, if they had those modifications, um, have the requisite capacity. Well, this other group or this other um, train of thought wants the FCC not to focus on the, what the capacity of the equipment could be if those changes were made, but what the capacity of the equipment is right now as of the time that those calls are being made, um, which would be a great win for the industry because if the FCC agrees, then predictive dialers would not necessarily be restricted uh, to call cell phones, um, provided that they don't currently have the capacity to, to dial numbers randomly and sequentially, which is uh, what the what the FCC focuses on. So just know that those petitions are out there. Um, they're being commented on. They're being discussed. Um, however, keep in mind that just because those petitions are out there and they're being considered and they're pending does not stay or prevent the enforcement of the existing um, restrictions. Everything we've talked about today will go into effect as scheduled unless and until the FCC rules otherwise based upon these petitions. And as we know, as I know personally, the FCC does not need to um, um, rule on petitions in any particular time frame. Um, some of you recall that I have petitions that are pending out there uh, that I filed on behalf of the American Teleservices Association back in 2005, which the FCC still has not ruled upon. So until, there's, um, until there is uh, more news to come, plan on these uh, rules going into effect. Exactly so. What about uh, the the calls specifically with cell phones to business numbers or for companies that are in collections? We get a, call, a lot of questions about that, and then the other question is, well, if I can't use a can't use my predictive dialer, can I use it in preview mode, or can I use this dialer here to call cell phones if it's on a one to one ratio? Well, I'll just answer that last point, and Joe, I'll let you talk about the B2B aspect of it. But again, the, right. the fact that, you, that a dialer may be used in, predict, in preview mode, one-to-one -one mode, again, the restrictions still apply because of, that, the, because of the capacity of the equipment, because the, capacity can't, the equipment does have the capacity to act as an automatic telephone dialing system or act as a random number generator or dial number sequentially. Again, it all comes down to um, the capacity of the machine if certain modifications are made to it. And in terms of the, the, the B2B issue, obviously a big question. Um, if, you, if you look at the language that the FCC has, uh, and it has always had, quite frankly, with regard to delivering pre-recorded messages to, um, uh, to a residential line, um, you know, they're, 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 that rule, that, uh, uh, that element of the, uh, of the FCC regulations, only applies to calls to residential lines. So all the stuff that we're talking about, pre-recorded uh, calls going to landlines, that only applies to residential. On the flip side, uh, the rule that says that you, uh, that you can't use an automatic telephone dialing system to call a cell phone, that language is just wide open. Uh, the, the FCC says uh, you can't initiate 
any telephone call using an automatic telephone dialing system to a cell phone. And I'm just I'm summarizing what the rule says there. Um, and of course, this language just cuts across everything. And uh, you know, if, if you just read the language, the the obvious reading of the language is that it just applies across the board. Don't make automatic telephone dialing system calls to cell phones unless you have prior express written consent. And if uh, if you want to parse it further and get into you know, whether or not the FCC ultimately has any intent uh, to go after the B2B world and uh, from an enforcement standpoint, you know, where does the FCC focus more in terms of uh, uh, B2C or B2B, well, then you, you know, you're, you're taking it into a different direction. But just based upon the regulations themselves, um, the, the rule about calling the cell phones, that just applies across the board. The pre-recorded uh, uh, rule regarding calls to, uh, uh, to landlines that only applies to residential lines. I just want to make one other point about the, just another landmine that's out there, which is the state issues when it comes to cell phones. Currently in our application, for example, we scrub for five states where in a sales environment, in fact, any call to a, to a cell phone in those states. Uh, is technically a violation. So, uh, I mean, those are those are active current rules. So it's just def definitely very dangerous when you talk about, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the U.S. only has a cell phone now. Every day we get all kinds of ported numbers from Newstar of all the data that's coming over from previous landlines, and that, that file has been increasing. And you've got more cell phones than you do landlines. Most people provide a lot of times, you know, just a cell phone as a contact on a form. So the impact of this, I think, is is very far-reaching. And like Joe said, the door is kind of wide open as far as not having a lot of the nuances and exemptions that the FTC had. Um, so I think that's why a lot of people are getting questions from all across the board. We've got a lot here that I think we'll try to follow up on um, individually, but I'm trying to cover cover them in. Uh, Themes, if you will, rather than go through them just, all individually. And I just wanted to add that uh, uh, Mitch uh, uh, put his finger on exactly what the biggest issue is, and that is how to get prior express consent to make a predictive dial a call to a cell phone. Um, and that's something that uh, lots and lots of companies out there are going to have to figure out over the course of the next year. Okay. Ryan, Mitch. Oh. I'm Hello? looking. Yeah, I'm looking at the. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at the play, questions play here, trying to figure out what's, what's next. That was a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of information to digest. I mean, I think that um, even if you're in this field, this stuff is confusing. Certainly, if um, you're just trying to jump in and, and figure all this out, it's even even more so. Well, let's. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, I was just going to kind of go through maybe a couple more questions. I mean, we've got a couple more minutes, and then kind of wrap things up for people. I don't know if you guys want to add anything else. It's just because you guys have already covered a lot. Maybe do a quick summary, or just kind of uh, wrap things well, up. But. What, what, one point that I wanted to make is uh, I fully anticipate, uh, and Mitch, you're probably going to experience the same thing, uh, October 17th of 2013, uh, we're probably going to get phone calls from people saying, what? what? What's this about this new rule that just went into effect? Um, and there's, there's no way around it. And uh, uh, for all the people on the line here, uh, don't fall into that category of, uh, of people that are not prepared, uh, certainly with regard to making calls using a predictive dialer to cell phones. Uh, because this gives, you know, the FCC has always had a, a pretty good focus on uh, making sure that its rules governing calls to cell phones uh, are followed. And now the protections are even greater. And I believe the impetus uh, to enforce those rules are greater as well. And Mitch? No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, the FCC has already been very aggressive with respect to um, enforcing 
um, robocalls, the, the existing rules, the existing prohibitions on transmitting uh, pre-recorded messages to, um, to cell phones, especially. And in fact, I've been, I'm involved in two different investigations right now. The FTC just had a workshop or a summit on robocalls earlier, it was either this week or last week. Um, so the government is spending a lot of time, effort, and attention on the issue about robocalls in general, and I fully expect the FCC to really crack down on calls to cell phones. Yeah, and it's, re it's really easy for people to say that you called my cell phone. That's all they pretty much have to say, and yep. most people are pretty... They, it seems like the, con the stuff that's out there in the news that people don't get all the call abandonment, opt out, all that, but they sure get the fact that, hey, you call my cell phone. And so that's a very easy complaint to file. Um, I've seen and heard more of the um, just people fed up with being being called. I mean, there's a lot of the, the emphasis on the robocalls is because there's a lot of pe people making illegal calls still. And there's more, more complaints last year than the few, few previous years, so that's a big issue is people are just fed up with, they're on the national DNC, now you're calling my cell phone, and, um, you know, the, the cycle for scrubbing is short. You've only got 15 days to purge your list. There's a short grace period on that. It's complicated to do cell scrubbing if you don't know what you're doing or have a good vendor. Um, you've got to pull in two lists. You've got to manage the, the port, and you've got to be a, uh, able to uh, document what you've been doing because, just to say that you were scrubbing is, is different than actually having um, an actual technology partner. So one thing we were willing to do, since this is kind of a big change, is someone wants to just do a, a quick wireless scrub, get it with us, get a report, find out what their exposure is, they're happy to do that. And then uh, we can also put together a, a little mini safe harbor checklist for you. Um, so that definitely would be uh, beneficial, highly recommended. Um, I think uh, Joe and Mitch have, have covered most of the main points. I don't want to get into some of the real um, detailed questions. I think those are maybe better left for uh, so follow via email. Hopefully, we can get the dialogue going on there. Um, but I think the 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 session we had was awesome. Uh, we I think we covered everything that uh, was out there. Unless you guys want to add anything else, otherwise, what I was going to do is get everybody an email. That attended with a link to the recording, which will be up in our, we have a uh, contact center compliance channel now on YouTube, and then also uh, drop the uh, slides, the slide share so you can check those out. And then we do have a, uh, a, a group on LinkedIn, the, the contact center compliance officers group. So we've been getting a lot, a lot of feeds from people with questions and updates there are always and, always fine. And Ryan, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, I also have a, a YouTube video, and you can find it if you do a search on Honey Badger Don't Care. <laughs> uh, the poor Honey Badger. <laughs> and Ryan, if I can just add, um, you know, if anyone has any um, specific questions, feel free to uh, reach out and call Joe or email Joe or me. Um, one thing I will say, Ryan, you, you did have my uh, email address wrong on that cover slide. <laughs> it should be mroth at rothdonorjackson.com, R-O-T-H donorjackson.com. Um, and I, I also disseminate information on Twitter. You can follow me on, on Twitter. And Joe and I do have a friendly competition about who has no more followers. So uh, you can find me at, at, at rothcompliance um, on Twitter. Um, oh, hey, uh, roth underscore compliance. Roth underscore compliance. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I try to uh, send out some updates um, on, on Twitter feeds. Excellent. All right. Well, That's Ryan, good. thank you very much for putting this together. Mitchell, yeah, pleasure great. working with you. Same here, Joe. It's fun. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.